<laughs> Feeding bees. It's an interesting subject for me. Um, a lot of people don't give it much attention. Uh, we're entering a time of year when I think it's very important to take a close look at the not only the weight of your colony, that, but what you can do to your colony to help it prepare for winter. It's more than just putting on weight. And some of the things I'm going to talk about in this presentation are out of the ordinary. Most people don't think about it. And it's, I'm going to talk about the chemistry of feeding and the mechanics of feeding and just what is happening when you're doing it. Um, this first slide that we have right here is a bee yard that we actually used to have in Hollywood, Georgia, uh, south of Lake Mont where we live. These folks uh, came out one day and informed us that the bees were in the swimming pool, okay, and then the bees had to go. And it was kind of an interesting thing. It was the daughter-in-law of the man who owned this property, and she'd had a swimming pool all along. And, uh, but the old fella, he was probably close to 90, and he just absolutely loved having those bees out in his front yard. They were really close to his house. And uh, they were allowing him to have the bees present while he was alive. And then shortly after the, he died, uh, the family informed us that the bees had to go. So... Chlorine pool, you know, most of us know that bees are highly attracted to chlorine and saltwater pools too. There are, there are ways of getting around that, and of course that's not what we're talking about tonight, but there are ways of having a swimming pool where it's not very attractive to bees, and if any of you need that information, talk to my wife right there. She, <laughs> she knows exactly how to do it because she used to have to contend with bees in the swimming pool. They were very attracted to the chlorine. <laughs> no, she didn't want to share a pool with a thousand bees for some reason. I never could understand that. Anyway, um, and I think I'll just read it out loud for you all in case somebody in the back can't really read it. A nectar flow or the provision of sugar syrup to a colony will increase the cleaning behavior, particularly stimulating older bees and generally lead to a reduction in brood diseases. And that is a quote from Fat Bees, Skinny Bees by Doug Somerville. He's an Australian researcher. And if you're really serious about feeding to uh, help your bees, it's worth looking at. You can download it online. Very worthwhile if you're curious about uh, feeding your bees and the benefits that you can get from it. So, why does a nectar flow promote overall colony health? And I'm going to start off by, let's see, I'm going to pick on somebody. Molly, what's the, what's the favorite food of bees? Uh, nectar, pollen. Golly, she got it right off yeah. the bat. It's a trick question. I, ac I actually ask that uh, quite often at a beekeeping meeting. I say, what is the, uh, the favorite food of bees? And everybody wants to say, well, honey, of course, yeah. right? No brainer. Yeah. It's the wrong answer. Yeah. Fresh incoming nectar is the proper answer. And uh, there's a reason for that. Um, there's some chemistry involved here. The first thing we need to know that'll, that helps some of the slides that are coming up make sense is that fresh nectar is primarily sucrose, which is the same sugar that table sugar is. Sucrose syrup is what we're going to be doing a lot of talking about here and how it can benefit your colony if it's used properly and the timing is good and all of that. So, um, let's see, I think, let me see where we go from here. Okay, I'll read this. In a feeding trial conducted to determine the difference between feeding sucrose syrup or HFCS, which is high fructose corn syrup, it was found that on average the colony supplied with sucrose syrup built 79 or 7,916 centimeters of honeycomb while the colony supplied with high fructose corn syrup only built 4571. The mean mass of bees supplied with HFCS was 4.65 kilogram, while those supplied with sucrose had a weight of 8.27 kilograms. Now I know that most of you aren't going to go out and get high fructose corn syrup for feeding your bees. High fructose corn, corn syrup has some advantages, but I think, I think the, the cons outweigh the pros. Here are some differences between high fructose corn syrup and sucrose syrup. Colonies gain weight better with the HFCS. Colonies fed HFCS swarm less than those fed sucrose syrup. P 
pure HFCS55 does not ferment easily and that is actually the, the uh, high fructose corn syrup that most commercial beekeepers are purchasing by the barrel, tote, or tanker load. I've used it myself in the past many years ago and um, when you compare it to the cost of producing or buying sucrose syrup it is definitely cheaper although that's changing a little bit because there's a corn shortage going on right now and of course that's where high fructose corn syrup comes from. HFCS is more stable in storage than sucrose which is absolutely true. Sucrose syrup is more stimulating than HFCS and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Colonies will rear more brood, draw foundation better, and are healthier on sucrose syrup. And as we saw in the previous slide, bees live longer and colonies also will overwinter better when fed sucrose syrup versus high fructose corn syrup. White sugar is pure sucrose and thus emulates nectar. Glucose and fructose were found to be half as attractive to foraging bees as compared to sucrose. Fat bee, skinny bees again. Sometimes when I talk about nectar being the bee's favorite food, if you want to prove it to yourself, just put a comb of honey and lean it against the tree during a major nectar flow and watch the bees completely ignore it until the nectar flows over and then they'll go over and rob it out. They really do prefer fresh nectar. And there's some chemistry going on when this sucrose nectar is coming in. The bees add three major enzymes to this incoming nectar. One is invertase, one is diastase, and the last one is glucose oxidase. Invertase inverts the sucrose into fructose and dextrose because the sucrose isn't soluble enough to become thick enough to not ferment. Whereas fructose and dextrose are more soluble, you can get more solids into a given amount of water. And you can get it thick enough where it won't ferment. We as beekeepers understand that we want to be below that magic number of 18 to 18.5 percent moisture so our honey won't ferment and that's very difficult to do with sucrose syrup unless you heat the, the water part of it up to a very high temperature which bees aren't in a position to do. Now <clears throat> diastase converts starch to sugar. It also used to be used to measure how much heat honey had been exposed to because it's easily, easily, the activity of diastase is easily destroyed by heat and before modern technology came around to, you know, um, for the importers and exporters and traders of honey to figure out what honey had been exposed to, they could put honey in a laboratory and see how intact the enzyme diastase was and they could tell if the honey had deteriorated from excessive heat, so it had its uses for even human uses. And then the third one is really the one that is most interesting to me and what is helpful to all of us as beekeepers, and that is glucose oxidase. Glucose oxidase produces gluconic acid, and gluconic a the presence of gluconic acid brings the pH of nectar down to an average of 3.9, which makes it very stable while ripening, and stable period because that kind of pH is somewhat antimicrobial, antibacterial. So, but what's interesting about the production of gluconic acid is that the bypro byproduct of that process is the production of hydrogen peroxide. And most of us know what that's good for. It's highly antibacterial and antimicrobial. And what happens inside a colony is that the presence, presence of hydrogen peroxide creates an antiseptic condition inside the colony. A lot of experienced beekeepers, I think Larry will agree with this, with a fresh incoming nectar flow suddenly some brood issues will disappear. Maybe you've got a mild dose of European fowl brood and with a nectar flow you see that it just disappears. Chalk brood disappears sometimes in a nectar flow and other brood issues that we sometimes don't even entirely understand. And that's because of all this chemistry that's occurring. Now, guess what? The same chemistry occurs when you're feeding thin sucrose syrup. You can create this antiseptic situation by feeding sucrose syrup in the right dilution. And, uh, and good times to do this are in the fall, which is coming up. 
when the goldenrod pollen is coming in, you can feed thin sucrose syrup and create this extra antiseptic situation while the bees are building up for the winter. I call it the fall buildup. And it's, it's coming really soon. In a few weeks, the bees are going to start to lay eggs that are going to become bees that hatch and have to make it all the way through winter. So I'm going to get off the subject of feeding for just a moment and say that's also the reason you need to have your treatments for mites in right now because you don't want to treat the bees that are going into winter. You want to treat the bees that are going to raise the winter bees. You need to get this brood nest as healthy as possible before your winter bees start being raised. So think about all of this together. Get your mites out of the way so the viruses are at a, at a minimal level. And uh, you, we don't have the benefit of a fall nectar flow here. In some states, goldenrod and asters actually create somewhat of a nectar flow and they have the benefit of all this chemistry because of that fresh incoming nectar. But we can create the same situation within sucrose syrup. So I'm an advocate of feeding bees early but thin and let them take a long time to put on the weight for the winter. If you run bees as a single story colony and you just took all your sourwood supers off, you may find that that single story colony has very little food in it. That's one of the issues with having a single rather than a one and a half or a double deep. You have to be very, pay very close attention to their weight this time of year. Some of our singles have a lot of weight in them, but some have hardly any because they put all the honey above the excluder into the honey supers and didn't put very much in the brood nest. That trait tends to be more distinct in Italian bees rather than Carniolan or Caucasian because the Italians tend to just try to rear a lot of brood and take their honey up, whereas the Carniolans try to keep a more defined brood nest and try to keep it surrounded with stores because that's their instinct. If you think about where those bees evolved in Slovenia and Australia, uh, Austria, not Australia, yeah. <laughs> Austria, uh, you know, it can snow in some of those places on the 4th of July and suddenly they've got to, you know, cluster and keep their brood warm. They can't have brood all over the place. And uh, so they keep honey right close to the brood and that's just the way those bees work. So if you have golden Italians and you've been running a single story colony, you might want to look at them very closely because they might not have any food in that single story colony right now. So rather than dump a bunch of weight in and plug out the brood nest too soon and too much, we like to start feeding thin sucrose syrup to the lighter colonies right now and let them start gaining weight slowly but surely all the way through August into September and hopefully have them up to the proper weight by the time uh, October comes. And you can feed in October, it's okay, but surely by the, by the month of November you really should try to uh, have your feeding finished because you don't want the bees that have to make it through the winter doing any work that's unnecessary, like, like processing sugar syrup. You want to have it behind you. That's it. Sucrose sugar. Go down to Walmart, Sam's Club, whatever. It's just, it's just table sugar. That's pure sucrose. So this slide is kind of interesting. Uh, Lewis Bartlett from the University of Georgia gave me permission to use this slide. We're back to talking about the presence of hydrogen peroxide. If you look to the left column, you're seeing the concentration of hydrogen peroxide in the honey in the colony. If you move to the middle part of the graph, you're showing what happens to hydrogen peroxide when feeding high fructose corn syrup. See the golden column there? That's what's happening to the hydrogen peroxide content when you feed thin sucrose syrup. They don't know what about high fructose corn syrup inhibits the presence of hydrogen peroxide, but they're working on it. Providing a steady but moderate amount of thin sucrose syrup will maximize the stimulation effect. Providing large volumes of thick syrup will significantly reduce the stimulative effect. That's why I like the idea of feeding steady over a period of time, thinner syrup, 
rather than just taking a hive top feeder and dumping three gallons on them that's gone in three days. There is no stimulation when you do that. And because of the chemistry that we just talked about, you're not getting the benefits of that antiseptic chemistry that you're creating with the steady uh, incoming thin sucrose syrup. So although hive top feeders have their place, and I've used them a lot in my past, I've actually sold them all. I no longer, I had hundreds at one time, and I've sold them all. I'd much rather feed with a bucket on top of my colony and let the, that two gallons or whatever, we're, we use one gallons and two gallon buckets. It takes a good strong colony, seven days, maybe 10 days to take down two gallons. And I'm gonna show pictures of our buckets and the holes and the lids and all of that in a moment. I'd rather it get you know, brought in over a period of time than just dumped on the colony. I hope you all are starting to understand my reasoning. The provision of nectar continues to keep the brood nest open and population replacement at a higher expanding level. This stimulus, this stimulus can be artificially created by the provision of sugar syrup. Again, don't just dump a bunch of sugar syrup in suddenly. Take your time and meter it out over a period of time. Back to what I said earlier, in order to do that, you've got to start early. You can't start putting in thin syrup and take a long time doing it on the 1st of October. You really need to start early for this idea to be a benefit to you. Okay, this slide is the beginning of two slides. This is the introduction. This is a very interesting study to me done in India of all places. And they're going to talk about these different concentrations of sugar and what they do to the brood in a colony. You might get asked the question, do you feed one to one or two to one? Thicker being two parts sugar to one part water. That's what a lot of people are taught by almost every bee book I've ever read. That's what you need to feed in the fall to prepare your colonies for winter. We're offering a little bit different idea here. And then you can see the other concentrations that they're going to show in this study. This is a 24-page research study, by the way, that I'm only going to show you two pages of. So keep that in mind, and I'm just going to try to explain the high points here. They did this study during a dearth, which we're kind of in right now. Okay, I'm going to explain this one to you. I hope you can all see it. If you look closely at this, what they're talking about is the percentage of brood on a given amount of comb covered by the bees. So if you look at T1, that's one to one. You have eggs, larva, and pupa. If you could add all those numbers together, you're gonna to be looking at the percent of brood that's underneath your layer of bees. But just go down to these different concentrations as the, uh, the syrup gets thinner and thinner and thinner, Go all the way to the bottom line, T4, one part sugar to 1.3 parts water, and look at those numbers, how they changed. From T1, it was, you know, 5.45 percentage was covered in eggs. Way down here, it's 22.25. They're stating that simply feeding thinner syrup will promote brood production, even in a dearth, and the thinner, almost the thinner, the better. I wish they would have went even thinner than this, like 1.5, to see what happened there. And I'd also would have liked to seen it compared to 2 to 1, which is very thick syrup. Looking at the 1 to 1, which we use a lot in our apiary, I would have to surmise that 2 to 1 would have very little effect in stimulating brood production. We're in a dearth period right now. We have very little pollen coming in and almost no nectar coming in. Now the pollen situation is going to change pretty soon. In about three weeks, we're going to have goldenrod pollen coming in. It could be a very good year for it because the moisture and the conditions that the plants look beautiful to me. If it doesn't rain too much through the month of September, we could have a really good pollen flow. And if we treat the feed situation properly and the mite situation properly, we could all have very good colonies going into winter. I don't believe there'll be a nutrition deficit this September. I'm starting to see golden rock now. Little bits of it, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a number of varieties of goldenrod. Yeah. The one that's blooming now is a minor variety. You're only going to see just a little bit of pollen from it. 
But the next one coming up that in two weeks, and it's at, we're actually starting to see a couple flowers on it now, and that is Helianthus. Helianthus is a big deal in some locations. It's in the sunflower family. The, the weed, it just looks like a weed. I guess it is a weed to most of us. It gets about yay high somewhere in this neighborhood. Has a little flower on it. Almost reminds you of a black-eyed Susan, but not really. It's like the... Uh, just looking at it, it's like the cross between a black-eyed Susan and a miniature sunflower or something. It's in the sunflower family and it produces a ton of pollen. If you've got it around, you'll know it because you'll see all of this golden yellow, a little bit orange type of pollen coming in and you'll wonder where it's coming from. Sometimes you won't even see the plants, but they could be over the ridge a quarter mile away. This is what we do. This is how we approach it uh, when we're trying to accomplish different things. Um, we've been feeding approximately 1.25 parts sugar to one part water for a while now. And much of what we've done this summer, we've used that concentration. And because it stimulates brood rearing and it stimulates wax production. Now one to one will stimulate some brood production and stimulate wax production. The bees will build comb on it beautifully, but we build colonies artificially a lot. In other words, we use sugar syrup as a tool to make colonies and draw comb and get them bigger and ready for winter and ready to sell. So if we're using thicker syrup, we might get some comb drawn out and we might get some brood produced, but we don't want the colony to get too heavy and too full of food so we use the term plugged out, where there's no room for the queen to lay. And that, uh, that happy spot for us seems to be about one and a quarter parts water to one part sugar, where we're putting on some weight, but not a lot of weight, and we're getting the brood production and the wax production we want. Now, when beekeepers come in, and Molly, you need to remember this, because you're gonna be the one talking to a lot of people that are purchasing packages and nukes from us next spring. When they come in and ask you what type of sugar syrup I should be feeding my nuke, the answer is one to one because it will not only stimulate brood rearing and wax production, but the unit will gain weight also. And that's important when you're trying to build a colony out, not just trying to make a colony ready to split again like we do, but actually turn it into a good colony that has the food and the resources they need. That's the answer, one to one. Now, a lot of people are, are going to ask you about, well, should I be... Uh, should I be feeding two to one in the fall? And it's a, it's a, it's a two-pronged answer. If it's late in the season and they're too light and they need to get food on before it gets too cold, the answer may be yes. But if it's early, like right now or perhaps the first of September, the answer is really to back it on down to at least one to one so you can get some of that chemistry occurring. This is tricky, not so much for you guys, but for commercial beekeepers who use three quarters of their tanker of sugar syrup, didn't need it all, and they save the rest till next year. It deteriorates just like honey does. Honey deteriorates in time, trust me, it does, especially at room temperature or above. And sugar syrup does the same thing. Now if you can keep it cold, like freezing or below 40 degrees, the deterioration is minimal, and that's okay. But uh, if it's room temperature, or especially days like we're having now in the 80s and maybe even 90s, sugar syrup deteriorates pretty rapidly just like honey does. Now, this isn't so much for us here. If I was talking to beekeepers in Minnesota, I'd really, I'd really get this driven home. Dark honeys, which are high in minerals, are harder on bees than light honeys. What honey? What honeys do we have here that are dark? I know pop, poplar is dark, uh, mimosa is dark, honeydew is very dark, and at least the honeydew we make here, some areas have lighter honeydew, but we don't have that here. And that's really high in minerals, is really not good for the bees. When bees face long periods with no cleansing flights, very dark honeys, which contain many indigestible solids, can nearly be a death sentence. If those bees can't get out for a couple months and defecate, all of that stuff that's indigestible just backs up. It, it just really messes them up. 
When you look at some of these beekeepers that are overwintering bees indoors in Canada or these barns in Idaho where they're putting them in for a few months until it's time to take them out for almond pollination or something like that, many of those guys are literally taking all of the honey away and feeding them back sucrose syrup to overwinter on and having way, way better luck. In other words, the bees are doing better on sucrose syrup than they do on honey when they can't get out and defecate often. That's not a problem here. Our bees usually get out at least every couple of weeks in the winter and that works. But in Minnesota, it could be a couple of months between cleansing flights and that's where these darker honeys cause trouble. So I guess the reason I'm throwing this in for this group of beekeepers is what I'm trying to do is drive home the fact that feeding bees properly is not a bad thing. I went to a beekeeping meeting about three years ago where a prominent, well-known speaker got up and told the whole group that if you feed your bees sugar syrup, it's going to make them lazy, sick, and what was there? Three things, lazy, sick, and weak. And I'm like, I'm back in the back row going, no, no. That's what I wanted to say, but I couldn't. I was being polite. He was the speaker. No, no, it does not. If done properly, it's actually good for your bees done properly, Okay. And this George, do you remember George Emery? He's a beekeeper from Maryland, and he was the one who invented the Emery shim. Yeah. That's him. This is the man. He was in Maryland, I believe. He's been gone for a while now, but he was very outspoken, as you can tell by reading this slide. I wish someone would explain to me the opposition or resistance of the average beekeeper to feeding his bee sugar syrup. It has been proven, not guessed, that sugar syrup is a better winter food than honey and never causes any gut problems to a bee that some honey do, some honeys do, particularly fall honey. That's actually an interesting website, or you know, it's, I think it's a website. Um, it's a group of papers and writings that, of his that somebody has compiled in a place where you can read them. It's worth looking at if you're interested in beekeeping in general. <clears throat> It, okay, <laughs> hang, hang with me here. This is a big deal. <clears throat> it is not, after just listening to that, I think you could buy into what I'm about to say, and it is not okay to feed molasses, sorghum syrup, maple syrup, fruit <laughs> juice, caro syrup, brown sugar, unrefined sugar, or powdered sugar, which contains starch, or organic sugar, which is not refined. You're looking for white sugar. You don't want all those minerals and the stuff that we may consider good for us and sugar is not good for bees in the long haul. You need to use refined white sugar when you're doing this. And you hear about beekeepers feeding, you know, outdated peppermint candy and all kinds of stuff. Uh, just, just don't do it, you know, just don't go there. We use both one and two gallon buckets depending, now we're out of the chemistry and we're getting into the mechanics. Before I go further, are there any questions on the chemistry behind feeding bees? Okay, that was easy. Okay, now the mechanics of how we do it. And I gotta say before I start that just because we do it a certain way doesn't mean it's the best way for you. This is what works for us. Um, I like